invite you this morning to open your Bibles to the book of Exodus chapter number 33. As you're turning there, I want to tell you about a young man that I read about. Fritjof Nansen was his name. He was a great Norwegian explorer who went to the north uh, to fathom the depths of the Arctic Ocean. Uh, Nansen, after he found this place and he was going to lower his lines, he, he lowered the first line that he had, but it never reached the bottom of the ocean there. And in his logbook, he simply recorded these words, deeper than that. The next morning, he dropped his second line. It didn't touch the bottom either. And in his logbook, he recorded these words, deeper than that. He continued with all of the lines that he had, and he still couldn't find the line that would touch the bottom of this vast ocean. After each attempt, he would write in his logbook, deeper than that. Finally, this pioneer oceanographer, frustrated as to what he should do next, tied all of the lines that he had together, attempting to plumb the depths of this ocean. After he had tied them all together and dropped them down as far as he could go, they still didn't reach the bottom. And Fritjof Nansen wrote these words, even deeper than that. Friends, this morning I want to tell you that if it was possible to tie together all of the depths to which man has tried to examine the glory of God, all we could say is still deeper than that. Amen. This morning I want to invite you to stand in order that we may reverence the Word of God and the God of the Word. I want to stand before you this morning, and I want to attempt to communicate the uncommunicatable. Uh, I, want to get a, I want to attempt to try to give us an understanding of that which we cannot understand. I want to try to help us comprehend the uncomprehendable. This morning, I want to talk to you for a few moments on a sermon that I have entitled based on Exodus 33, verse number 18, Show me thy glory. Verse 18, God's word says, And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Father, we love you. Father, we thank you and we praise you for this opportunity to read your word today. Father, we stand today acknowledging our feebleness, acknowledging the, uh, the finite minds that we have. Lord, we know that our finite and feeble minds cannot comprehend an infinite God. But Father, today we pray that you would show us a little bit of your glory. Father, through the aid of your Holy Spirit, help us to see and help us to understand just a little bit from your word today. And then help us to respond in the way that you would have us to respond. Father, we love you. We thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name that we ask these things. Amen. You may be seated. Christian author A.W. Pink once wrote of this verse. He said, our pen falters as we take up such a verse as this. For what sinful creature is competent to write upon such an exalted theme as the glory of God? Friends, I want to tell you that I, I cannot in one sitting, nor in an entire lifetime, can I expound upon all that there is concerning the glory of God. What I will tell you this morning is that over 300 times the Word of God references the glory of God. You see this word glory of God used for the very first time in the book of Exodus. You see it written for the very last time in the book of Revelation. And I want to tell you, I believe on all of the pages of this book, we see the glory of God. It is woven throughout Scripture, but when I make a statement like that, it begs the question then, what exactly is the glory of God? If we were to look at a modern-day definition of the word glory, uh, I went to a Webster's Dictionary, uh, and the, the, the English word glory in the modern usage today is to, to give praise or to give honor or even to worship a deity is a definition that Merriam-Webster would give. But what I want to tell you this morning is that the word glory is a very hard word to define. Let me give you a quick example. It's kind of like the word beautiful. Have you ever tried to define the word beautiful? Someone says, what does it mean to be beautiful? And I know all of you think, Candace, but, but someone, ain't that right, buttercup? All right. 
It's one of those, it's not really an ambiguous word, but it's a word that we all know. We all know how to use it, but it's a difficult word to describe by using words. Often we have to point to a picture or something else. But I want you to catch this. In the modern day English, we use the word glory to mean praise or honor or worship. But did you know that the most uh, uh, direct uh, translation of the Old Testament word for glory is a word picture for the idea of a weight or something heavy. Uh, I want you to think about this. Uh, this idea of a weight or something heavy as used in the Old Testament when it is uh, ascribed or when it is given to a person is this idea of being overwhelmed by the weight or by the greatness of that person. You see, using the Old Testament usage of this word, we can gather that the glory of God then is the weight or the heaviness of all that God is that makes him great. We sang a song earlier, How Great Thou Art. And I noticed that many of you were like me, that sometimes I feel like my words are not enough, and so I just have to close my eyes, and I just have to say, Lord, my words are cheap, but just here's me with all that I am describing and proclaiming your greatness. I want to tell you, when you think about that greatness of God, what you are thinking about is the glory of God. And I want to examine this passage of Scripture. Many of you probably are familiar with the context. You remember that Moses has already talked to God about this personal relationship that he has with God. But I want to do this this morning. I want to take just a moment to look at this and other Scriptures. And I want to examine this text, listen, with the goal of gaining just a small glimpse of the glory of God. Notice with me, if you would, I'm going to get right into this. Verse number 18, I want you to notice the request to see God's glory. I want to tell you, friends, Moses is sitting here. You may recall from last week's message, Moses is in this tent of the congregation. He is meeting with God in a close and in a personal way. And here Moses asks in verse number 18, he says, God, show me your glory. You may recall that Moses has already asked God, show me your ways that I may know you. And God answered that prayer. And kind of like us sometimes, when we ask something and it is granted, sometimes it emboldens us to ask for a little bit more. And here Moses goes on and he says, okay, Lord, show me your glory. And I want to focus really on two things. Number one, I want to focus on what it is that Moses is asking. And I believe to try to keep it real simple and not complicate the word of God, what Moses is saying is, Lord, let me see your glory. Let me see what it is that makes you great. God, I know you're great. You have proven you are great. But up to this point, think about it, up to this point, all Moses has ever heard was a voice. Remember Moses at the burning bush, he heard a voice. Moses had been on the top of Mount Sinai and heard a voice. Moses meeting with God in the temple of the, con uh, of the congregation, uh, the tabernacle of the congregation. He hears the voice of God and here God has answered his prayer and Moses says, God, let me see your greatness. Show me what it is, God, that makes you so great. You see, the what of Moses' request here is fairly straightforward, but I want to ask one other question. Why? I mean, the Bible clearly tells us that the, the just shall live by faith. We know that faith is believing without seeing, so why then would Moses say, God, I want to see your glory? Let these, uh, let these thoughts sink in very quickly. Number one, you remember that God gave Moses a job. Take these people from Egypt to the promised land. Things didn't go as smooth as Moses had hoped. This was a complaining people. This was a spiritually adulterous people. His very brother. Remember when, when God first spoke to Moses there with the burning bush and Moses says, God, I don't know if I can do it. God, I don't speak very well. And God says, I'm going to give you your brother. This was the right hand man who led the revolt against God. Moses has been through, if you'll allow me to use these words, one of the most discouraging one of the most disillusioned and one of the most dry seasons of his ministry. I want you to think about this for a moment. 
Here all of the, uh, uh, the people that he's been tasked to lead have been led astray. And if you don't think for one second that when people you have been tasked to lead go astray, if you don't think that affects you, then you don't understand the ministry. I'm going to tell you right now, this was a heavy and a dry season that Moses was bearing. Moses, you remember God had already pulled his presence from the nation of Israel. God was still speaking directly to Moses, but he had already pulled his presence out from amongst the people. And Moses, you might recall, very well could have said, all right, God, it's just you and me. Let's ditch them. But he didn't. Moses interceded for the people. And I want you to think about this. Moses, the Bible tells us when he came down from the mountain and saw all of this, Moses lost his cool. Oh, by the way, every now and again, preachers lose their cool. Amen? I don't know that I've ever broken any stolen tablets, but I know there's been times I wanted to. You know what I'm saying? But Moses, he, listen, he's gone through all of this. He's been through a dry season. You ever been there? He's been through a disappointing season. You ever been there? He's been through a disillusioned season. And I want you to listen to this truth. Why did Moses ask God? To reveal him his glory. Because I think Moses knew that the best cure for discouragement, for disillusionment, and for dryness is a fresh glimpse at God. I'm here to tell you this morning that I may be speaking to one of you today that says, I know what it's like to be in that dry season. I may be speaking to one today that says, I know what it's like to be discouraged. I know what it's like to feel the weight of the world on my shoulders, and I don't know what to do about it. Can I encourage you this morning? You do the same thing that Moses did. Ask God to reveal to you his glory. Some of you say, preacher, is it worth it? Uh, listen to what God's Word says in the New Testament, Philippians chapter 4. I know you and I think that we're smarter than God. <laughs> no one wants to admit that because you would have shouted amen, right? None of us want to admit that we think we're smarter than God. But listen, when we go through seasons of discouragement, when we go through seasons of dryness and disillusionment, you know what our response is? Worry. Our response is to become anxious. But you know what the New Testament says in Philippians chapter 4, verse number 6? Listen to this verse. Be careful for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. Don't worry. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, listen to this part. Let your requests be made known unto God. Friend, taking the New Testament principle of don't worry but let your request be made known unto God and understanding that we know what it's like to be in that dry season and in that moment of discouragement. And I want to encourage you this morning, friend. Let your requests be made known unto God. Maybe your request is, Lord, show me your glory. Lord, show me what it is that makes you great. It's not that I didn't believe it before. I just need to see it again. I don't want you to notice with me number two. I'm going to move through this quickly this morning. But I want us as we examine this text to not only see the request to see God's glory, but I want you to notice number two, the revealing of God's glory. Look at verse number 20. Exodus 33 in verse number 20, God's word says, And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass while my glory passes by, that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by, and I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Number one, can I just state the most obvious truth that you and I can learn from this today? And that is that I believe God will honor the request. When we pray, Lord, show me, God says, Okay. Now God's going to do it his way. God told Moses plainly, Moses, in your sinful and finite condition, you cannot look at me and live. But God made a way. He said, Moses, I got a plan. I'm going to put you there in the cliff of the rock. And I'm going to cover you with my hand. And when I pass by, I'll remove my hand. And I'll let you see just a little bit of who I am. I'm going to tell you, as I was reading this passage, I saw the request of Moses. And I see here the answer of God. And, and it led to more questions for me. I thought about this. What, is, what exactly is God going to reveal? Uh, I thought, well, what about it? I mean, it, it would take a, a lifetime of us 
to, for God to reveal all of who he is. And we still wouldn't comprehend it. But I thought about it. Moses says, Lord, show me a little bit. God says, I'm going to give you a glimpse. I'm going to let you see just a little picture. And I began to wonder, what about God did he feel was the most important thing to show Moses? You know, I thought about it. Maybe God would show him his justice. Because let's be honest, God is just. I thought maybe God would show Moses his holiness. Because guess what? God is holy. I thought maybe God would show Moses his wrath. I thought maybe God would show Moses his justice. I, I, I'll tell you how sometimes juvenile my little mind is. I thought, well, maybe God would just cause an earthquake or something and just show Moses how great he is. Let me tell you what blew me away. Moses says, Lord, show me your glory. God says, I'm going to pass by and I'm going to show you a little bit. But notice verse number 19 that I skipped over. Verse number 19, here's what God said. He said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. As I sat and prepared these notes, as I was trying to, to, to think and try to, to, to put on paper all that God is and all that God does, I was struggling trying to, to fit God in a box and then I caught what God said in verse number 19. You see, one of the, the, the thing that God chose to reveal to Moses, the thing that makes God great <coughs> is his goodness. Adam Clark, a Bible commentator on this verse, says that God is saying to Moses, I will show myself to you as a fountain of inexhaustible compassion. Benson, a Bible commentator, said this. He said, all of God's attributes are glorious. Yet he glories most in the manifestation of his goodness. And that is what his creatures need the most. You know, I have to be very honest with you here. I, as I thought about God, as I thought about the, the thing that makes God great... I don't know that goodness was the first thing that popped in my mind. But I got to wondering, why then? Why would God say that his goodness is the, is the thing about him that he wanted Moses to see above all else? And I'll tell you why. Because if we forget that God is good, you can get a very tainted view of God. This week I watched a video it was an interview between Ben Stein and Richard Dawkins, supposedly one of the smartest atheists in the world today. And in this video, uh, uh, Ben Stein asked Richard Dawkins about a book that he had written. And he said, in your book, you said that God was not nice. And Richard Dawkins says, no, that's not what I said. He said, in my book, I wrote these words, and I quote, the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it. A petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak. A vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser. A misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. That was the definition that Richard Dawkins had of God. That was the view that he saw of God as he examined the God of the Old Testament. And friends, I hope I don't need to spend a lot of time this morning telling you nothing could be further from the truth. The Bible tells me that God is good. The New Testament tells me that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. And I know what some may be thinking, but preacher, you don't know what I'm going through. I don't, but God does, and He's still good. As many times as I want to stop and look to God and say, God, why are you letting me go through this? I'm reminded sometimes that God could have said, you should have seen what it would have looked like if I hadn't intervened. See, friend, if we're not careful, 
we can have a very tainted and a very sad view of God. Oh, by the way, if Richard Dawkins' view of God was accurate, I wouldn't want that God either. But you know, at the end of this interview, this is not in my notes, but I just thought it was pertinent. At the end of this interview, Ben Stein asked Richard Dawkins, he said, what would you do if you found out later in life that this real God existed? What would you say to him? And Richard Dawkins referred back to a quote that he had read I, off the top of my head. I can't remember the name, but he said, I would look at him and say, sir, why did you make yourself so hard to find? I want to tell you, friend, according to this word, God is not hard to find. And I want to tell you that if you're willing to look in this word, it is not hard to see the truth that God is good. Friends, what God does in the next chapter, chapter number 34, God tells Moses, why don't you come on up here to the top of Sinai? He said, I've got this place up here where I can hide you. And, uh, and God calls Moses up. And I want you to notice the way that God further reveals himself. All of this under the umbrella of goodness. But man, I'm telling you what, when I started thinking about God, I couldn't find a better description. Exodus 34, look at verse 5. Verse number 5 says, And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God. Listen to this part. Merciful. As God is describing himself to Moses here, he speaks of his pity, of his tender compassion, just like that of a father to his children. He uses the word gracious. This speaks not only of God having compassion for his creatures, but it speaks, it's a word that says that God finds satisfaction in showing compassion. God uses the word long-suffering there to describe himself. He says that he is slow to anger and that he delays executions of his justice. He uses this word that he is abundant in goodness and in truth. Friends, aren't you thankful that the springs of God's mercy never run dry? Look at verse number 7. Keeping mercy for thousands. This is the part that blows me away sometimes. Forgiving iniquity and transition, uh, transgression and sin. God says, let me tell you about me, Moses. Let me tell you about my glory. I'm a forgiving God. Now he quickly follows that up with a statement that says, and that will by no means clear the guilty. <coughs> God says in, in one breath, he says, I am a forgiving God, but he very quickly reminds that I am also a holy and a just God. Friends, I want to tell you, God is not just going to look at your sin and turn away. That would violate his goodness. You see, in his goodness, God must uh, appropriately deal with sin. And so here's what God does. God says you can pay the penalty for your sin by your own death. Or, he said, I sent my son Jesus to be your substitute to pay for your sin. Friend, I've had people ask me before, how do, you, how do you speak of a God? How do you believe in a, in a God of goodness with all of the evil that's in the world today? I've shared this with you before, but I'll tell you what I told them. I said, when you read the beginning of this book, God created a world that was perfect and it was good. When you read the end of this book, God is going to create a world that is perfect and it's going to be good. We're just in the middle right now. And I'm telling you, friend, God is good. Let me tell you how good God is. I know I don't have a lot of time left this morning, but let me tell you how good God is. I want you to think about these specific things that God just said. He said, I'm merciful. He said, I'm gracious. He said, I'm long-suffering. He said, I'm abundant in goodness and truth. He said, I am forgiving. Think about the context. The context was Moses was interceding for a people who had turned their back on God. Moses was the one that said, God, don't leave us. And God says, let me tell you, Moses, I'm a good God because I'm long-suffering. I'm merciful. I'm gracious. Some of you say, preacher, I know that. I know God is good. What, what is this all about today? I want you to notice very quickly verse number 8. Verse number 8, and Moses made haste 
This is after God revealed himself to Moses. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. I won't spend a lot of time on this this morning, but can I tell you that if you will make the prayer, Lord, show me your glory. I believe God will. And when we see God for who he is, we cannot help but bow on our face before him and worship him. Notice with me thirdly and lastly, not only the request to see God's glory and the revealing of God's glory, but notice with me the reflection of God's glory. Go to the end of chapter number 34. Moses spends a moment up on the mountain with God and the presence of God. Moses sees the glory of God. And in Exodus 34, verse 29, And it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount, that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh him. And Moses called unto them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned unto him, and Moses talked with them. And afterward, all the children of Israel came nigh, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai, verse 33, until Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. Let me just make two points very quickly, and then I'm going to be done this morning. Number one, when Moses asked to see the glory of God, Moses saw the glory of God and there was a visible evidence that he had been in the presence of God let me word it to you this way there was a change in Moses that others could see some of you still look like you don't fully understand exactly what this would have looked like I want you to imagine for a moment that in the month of January somebody you knew went and spent two weeks in the Caribbean and then they came home, all of us pasty white from no sun, they come home just as tanned and as sun-shaded as possible. They stood out. I'm not naming names, amen? <laughs> but I'm telling you, if you go to the Caribbean for two weeks in January, come back to the Northwest, we can tell because we can see it on your face. Friends, if you spend two weeks in the sunshine, you're going to get sunburnt. But if you spend time in the presence of the Son of God, you will also be sunburnt. Amen? Amen. And I want you to catch this truth. Nowhere in the Scriptures does it ever say that the face of Moses shone prior to being with God. The face of Moses shone only after he spent time with God. Friend, I want to tell you that if you say, if you're moved today and you say, Preacher, I, I want to pray that God would show me his glory. I believe God will reveal to you his glory. God will reveal to you what makes him so great. But not solely so that you can soak it up and say, oh, look at me. You see, I believe God reveals to us his glory in order that we might reflect that glory. And that others may see him in us. Ian Humphrey, Christian writer, said this, speaking of the glory of God. He said, the heavens declare it. Creation witnesses it. The church embodies it. And the Christian should reflect it. As I stand here this morning before you, as I stand here and I consider the glory of God. I can only, with the limits of my language and with the limits of my mind, I can only touch the tip of the iceberg. So when it comes to the glory of God, suffice it to say this morning, even deeper than that. Friend, we cannot comprehend what makes God so great. But just because we can't comprehend all of it, don't let that stop you from seeking and requesting it. This morning as our song leader and our pianist come, I believe that if you'll request.